This pitcher was the strikeout king of the league. Uh, people weren't supposed to hit home runs off of him, let alone me. I was not necessarily a long ball hitter. One of those boomers who elevated freak into a compliment and turned party into a verb. Well, I'd rather see the futuristic Bob Hope, not his house. She leaned close to Leonard and whispered, they say half of his body was operated animatronically toward the end. My name is Paul Johnsgaard. Uh, I've lived in Nebraska now since 1961. That's what, 42 years, 43, 40, excuse me, 43 years. Uh, and used to uh, be a teacher for a living, but I retired three years ago. So <laughs> right now I'm, I'm, I'm just enjoying myself. <laughs> I, uh, of course, went to grade school in Wapaton, North Dakota, where I spent most of my childhood years. Then on to uh, a junior college in Wapton, then on to Fargo at the State University, it was then called the State College. Uh, then on to Washington State University for a master's, then on to Cornell for a PhD. From there, two years in England on a postdoc, which I finished in 1961 and came to Nebraska in the fall of 1961, where I've been ever since. Mine in Nebraska really has shaped my life. I, I grew up on the plains in North Dakota. And when I came to Nebraska, I really had never set foot in the state, but I had heard it was much like North Dakota, and so I knew I'd love it, and I didn't realize how much I would love it with the Sand Hills and the Platte Valley and the Niobrara Valley. So I just decided to spend the rest of my career here. That was a pretty early decision that I made. Uh, so, uh, so I don't regret that at all. I did my first writing for publication when I was a senior in college at Fargo. I wrote a 16-page booklet on the waterfall of North Dakota, which was distributed free as a sort of uh, extension type thing. And uh, as a graduate student, I began to dream of writing a book. I thought if I could write one book, that would be my contribution to science. And I had two years in England then on my postdoc, which uh, gave me an opportunity to not only write one, but I wrote the manuscripts for two. I uh, submitted the major one, the sort of serious one, for publication uh, as soon as I started school here, started work here, and Cornell published it. The other one I didn't think was worth publishing, and so I didn't submit it. But the then director of Nebraska Press, when he learned I'd published a book with Cornell, was very annoyed and said, I have to do something for him. <laughs> so I said, well, I've got, this, I've got this manuscript, but I don't think it's any good. Mm -hmm. And so he nonetheless followed me to my office and uh, took the manuscript. And the next day, he called and said, yes, we're going to publish this. And that, that was Waterfowler Biology and Natural History. And that won several awards within a few months. And so I realized. Writing's easy, I might as well do this. <laughs> people who have, the people who have been most relevant, stimulating, uh, model-based uh, people have been a few authors, most importantly Aldo Leopold. Uh, I received a copy of Aldo Leopold's San County Almanac for Christmas when I was a, a senior in high school in 1949. And I almost memorized that book. Uh, I was so taken by his writing style. So for most of my career, when I'm writing to a general audience, I've tried to emulate that style, which is hard to do. He was a superb writer. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I've very consciously studied his style of writing and uh, tried to write as much as I possibly could in a similar vein. The other person who I think has greatly influenced me, although I've never been able to emulate her, is Annie Dillard, uh, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. I often read her, her work and wish I could write that well, but I, I've never tried to actually imitate it or to uh, model mine after her, I just envy it, you know, that's all I can do. Yeah. 
I've always needed to draw. And to my mind, drawing and writing are very similar processes. Uh, I was drawing birds when I was five years old. My mother kept a scrapbook of my early stuff. And there are drawings of birds done when I was five. Writing, I, I took a course in journalism in high school. I never took a writing course ever. But that journalism course and then English composition in college were my two sort of training grounds, I guess, for writing. But uh, I, I, I've had a compulsion to write or draw or do something creative like carving all of my life. If I spend a day and don't do sort of one of those things, uh, then it seems like a wasted day. I guess I was writing probably five hours today. And I'm retired. I'm not supposed to be doing anything. What inspires me to write? Often it's being outside. That's the usual thing. I, do, I write in two broad categories now. One is to document the natural world based on, on what I can learn about it, whether it's secondhand material from science resources or firsthand information from what I see. And uh, those two sources are, are almost equally important. I would say of my 46 books, I guess, probably the majority are, are based on surveying the technical literature, the material from all over the world and, and putting it together in readable form. Uh, but the last four, three or four books I've done have mostly been personal, personal experiences, if you will, with, with animals, wildlife of the Great Plains, uh, uh, prairie birds, uh, and one or two others, the Natural History of Nebraska, which has a lot of personal experiences with nature in Nebraska or the Plains. So, so those are the two sources. <laughs> My only topic is nature, frankly. <laughs> I've uh, rarely strayed from it. Once my daughter and I, uh, Karen, did a book on dragons and unicorns, which was still sort of nature, but it was mostly whimsical, uh, mythological, uh, humorous, if you will, kind of writing. Uh, but, but still, in a sense, nature-oriented. It was a kind of an allegory for conservation of rare and unusual animals. That was the theme that went through it, one of the themes. Uh, but, but I rarely write about people. The, and and my, one of my most recent books on Lewis and Clark is not about Lewis and Clark. It's about the animals that, and plants that Lewis and Clark uh, encountered and discovered. So the expedition is very secondary to the biology of the expedition. Uh, so, so I'm not much good at writing about people. I've, I've, I, I did a little children's book for our children, Mountain Dreams, which is mostly about the animals that were, if you will, pets of this little boy, magpie and a dog and a dinosaur, <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing. So I, I'm not very good at writing dialogue. I really am pretty poor at that, so I don't even try. I, I work pretty continuous. I was at campus 7 o'clock this morning, and I, I wrote almost continuously till 4 this afternoon. Uh, so I often write 8 or 9 hours a day with a break for lunch, but otherwise long stretches. Uh, I don't write at home anymore. Uh, you know, seven or eight hours a day at, at work is enough. I don't need to do it at home, although I'll sometimes take drawings home and work on them in the evening. Uh, but, uh, uh, but generally, uh, just long stretches of writing. I, I really need a quiet place to write. My shift in writing, for many years, probably my first 10 books were done with a manual typewriter. I did very little revising. It's just a, a nuisance, of course, to retype pages. And then uh, in about 1977, I got my first electric typewriter, which I used until 1982, I think, I had a heart attack. 
and uh, I had to remain at home for about five weeks. And I, by chance, I just bought uh, my daughter and my son little Apple computers. And I thought, well, this is probably the time to learn how to use those silly things, because I'm not going to do it otherwise. So I, I had five or six weeks at home to play with writing on a computer, and I wrote probably a third of a, of a book that I started at that very time, just partly to, to learn how to do it. And of course, that became my standard way of operating. It allows for any number of revisions. The only disadvantage is you don't have a rough draft. You know, I used to yeah. sometimes keep a rough draft for the fun of it. And I think I gave you, that is, the Heritage Room, a rough draft of Dragons and Unicorns, which was one of the last books that I think I wrote we wrote on, on a typewriter. I write for many audiences. I've tried to write for children, which is, I think, the hardest audience. And I don't think I was terribly successful with prairie children. And the Dragon and Unicorn book was not really a children's book at all. It was really written for adults. Uh, Those of the Grey Wind, a book about sandhill cranes, has children as characters. And I think it's probably the most readable of the books for younger people, although probably the majority of people who buy it are, are adults. Uh, and then I write really, uh, really boring books for scientists, uh, monographs. I haven't done that for a while, but probably 10 or 15 of the books I've written were really for, for serious ornithologists. The things like the busters of the world. <laughs> I said the other day I told somebody I'd written a book on the busters of the world. And he thought I was joking. <laughs> Didn't know there were such a group of birds as busters. <laughs> it's very hard getting published now. I think I was lucky. I started publishing books when there weren't a lot of, uh, I think, a lot of other people trying to get published. I've never had a book manuscript turned down. And I think that's very unusual. Um, but I've never had a, uh, an agent, which is also probably unusual. But I think, I think it's very difficult to break into publishing. And, and what I would recommend for people who really want to write books is to start writing for magazines uh, and hone your skills by learning how to write for magazines. Several of my books came about as a sort of an outgrowth of articles I wrote for magazines, natural history, and things like that. That gets your work before the public, and editors can uh, evaluate how well you write. So uh, I, I, I did a lot of that sort of thing in my earlier years writing for nature magazines. <laughs> but I'd, I'd like uh, to finish 50 books. I'm within about three or four of that. Uh, I'm running out of topics. It gets harder and harder to find a totally new topic. I've exhausted all of the obvious bird groups. You have to go to things like trogons and quetzals, which are pretty obscure groups of birds. I've concentrated more on Great Plains regional writing. And uh, um, I don't know how many more books of that general type I can do. But I never know. Uh, I, the idea for a book often comes up just totally out of the blue. And then within a day or two, I'm hard at it. So, so I don't know what the next few books are going to be. Sure. I'm writing a book on the Niobrara Valley, which is 90% done. Um, and that came about sort of as a, just a, a, a stray thought, if you will. I thought it might be kind of fun to spend some time on the Narbrera, and uh, it developed into a book. Uh, a book on <laughs> the prairie dog came about partly as a result of going to a game and parks meeting dealing with the protection or, unfortunately, the non-protection of prairie dogs. And I got so upset about it, uh, the failure to protect them, that I decided to write a book. So, so I don't know what's going to happen. But I'll be either writing or drawing, that's for sure. <laughs> Places that have inspired me to write books about them are the Platte River. My first sort of regional book was about the Platte River and associated birds, especially cranes. Uh, then I spent 17 years at our 
field station in Ogallala, just next door to the Sand Hills, and I fell in love with the Sand Hills. And so uh, that became a book. And uh, finally then, I decided to do the whole state. And so that gave me an excuse to travel around some of the parts of the state. And most recently, the Niobrara. I, I, I just hadn't spent enough time up on the Niobrara, and the more I was up there, the more I decided there should be a book about it. So, uh, so those are my, my favorite places. The very favorite place and the very favorite time and, uh, is really the Central Platte valley right now, namely the middle and latter part of March when all the cranes are there, half a million cranes. It, it's, yeah. it's, it's better than the Serengeti, uh, which is where most people imagine this is the wildlife heaven. The Serengeti is not as good as the Platte Valley in March. I've been to the Amazon and I've been to the Arctic several times. I've been to Australia. Uh, there isn't any place better than the Central Platte Valley. Uh, historic records only go back to the mid-1800s when some of the early fur traders and, and immigrants saw flocks of cranes, not very big flocks, but nonetheless flocks of cranes uh, near Grand Island. So there have been cranes there, and there's a fossil sandhill crane that goes back literally millions of years, so we assume that that's, this has been going on for millennia, eons. Uh, but in the last 40, 50 years, the time I've been here, the cranes have become compressed in the, in the part of the river they, they concentrate on. The numbers have increased and in the part of the Platte, namely from, well, roughly Kearney to roughly Grand Island, somewhat farther west than Kearney. That's where most of the cranes are now. And even in, in the years I've seen them, they've gravitated eastwardly more and more toward Grand Island as the more western parts of the river have grown up to trees, which cranes don't, don't like. They like open space. Uh, so cranes have been using that river for far longer than we have any records. And they'll continue to use it as long as the river is a river, which there's some doubt about, I guess. And as long as there's corn out there in the spring, and that could change too as water supplies tighten up. Uh, so, so we're we're in a situation where this is the very best place for them to be anywhere between uh, New Mexico and the Arctic uh, in the springtime. Well, I uh, mentioning that owl, I used to carve quite a lot. And uh, I kept most of my carving, I still have probably 90% of them. But I was in a, for a period I was carving owls and I had this beautiful piece of, of cedar. And uh, I thought it, it had an owl inside it. It, uh, it only took probably four or five hours to carve, I guess. And it was one of two. The other one, as I told Joanna, I had on exhibit at the Unitarian Church and it got stolen. I think not by Unitarian, but they'd rented, <laughs> they'd rented the church out to, a party and it disappeared and so because of the implications of owls and wisdom uh, I thought the remaining owl probably should uh, go to a library so that's how it came down here and uh, I'm pleased it's here I, I gave it to the library with the thought that they could sell it and make some money and of course then as, as was mentioned it became a uh, an auctioned item and was returned back to the library eventually. So that's very nice. Um, I want to not so much read, although I will do a few readings. I'd rather talk about uh, sort of uh, my writing background, which goes back a long time. Uh, Joanna, before, before this talk, asked me when I started writing, and, uh, and it goes back really to uh, undergraduate college days. But uh, I didn't really begin uh, writing books until, uh, until I came to Nebraska. I'd spent a couple of years in England doing postdoctoral work and actually wrote two book manuscripts while there, one of which was a really boring book that I submitted to Cornell Press and which they published. The other was a much better more interesting book, but I didn't think was worth publishing, frankly. 
uh, nonetheless, the then editor, the then director editor of Nebraska Press thought it was worth publishing, and he did. And uh, it won two or three awards within a year and was named one of the 100 best books in science of that year. And I thought, boy, they don't know what they're doing, but this is up pretty easy. I can, uh, if I can write books that easily. So, uh, so that got me off on, on writing. And the first, uh, the first 10 years or so, I came here in 61. For the f most of the first 10 years, I wrote pretty much uh, text-like reference things, apart from that, that, that uh, book I just mentioned. Uh, but I found that I wasn't really getting to the audience that I thought I would like to get to. I, I really wanted to reach a broader audience. And as a professor, you have to be pretty careful what you write, or people will accuse you of popularizing your stuff, catering to the masses. And so, uh, so I finally decided, once I got tenure, I decided I could risk it. <laughs> and uh, in the early 70s, Actually, I know the very day I got this idea. It was a Saturday in spring, probably about 72, and I came down to the then Miller and Payne bookstore, which was not very far from here, a few blocks away down on Old Street, and uh, came down there to sign a few copies of this more popular book that I had written back in the late 60s, in the 60s. And uh, it was on Saturday, and the manager of the bookstore said, um, well, um, John Nyhart was in a few days ago, and he signed some copies of Black Elk Speaks. You probably ought to buy one. It's a good investment, and if you haven't read it, uh, you might like it. So I did. And uh, it was, as I say, a, a nice afternoon, so I took it home and started reading it and was really quite in the modern vernacular, blown away by, by that book. I hadn't read any of Nyhart. I'm part Native American, and I think this predisposed me to, to love the story. But one of the visions of Black Elk that was recounted in Nyhart's book was of, of uh, uh, clouds transforming themselves into geese in the sky and geese transforming themselves into white horses in the sky. It was a, a magical description of this sort of dream or vision that Black Elk had. And I couldn't escape it. I, I thought about that, and I thought about the apparent sort of quasi-mystical values that uh, birds, specifically geese, must have had to the Oglala Dakotas, at least. And I was, at that time, writing a really boring book on the waterfall of North America which uh, was subsequently published, but I thought, God, this is a very different way of thinking about waterfowl values than trying to figure out how many dollars hunters spend on, on hunting geese. So I, I couldn't sleep that night. I tossed and turned thinking about the Nyhart book and my own efforts of writing this, uh, this monograph on, on waterfowl. Finally, about 2 o'clock in the morning, I got up and started scribbling down some ideas for a book of my own on, uh, on geese, specifically on snow geese, the subject of, of that vision of black elk. I never do that. I've never, I'd never written that hour of night before, and I've never done it since. But I was just simply compelled to get up and, and start writing. The next day, I went to the library, Love Library, and started reading all I could find on Indian and uh, Eskimo myths about snow geese and, and related Arctic birds and just buried myself in that literature for probably a month or so, and also applied for a small grant from the American Philosophical Society to go up to the Arctic to see snow geese on the breeding ground. I'd been to the Arctic before, but I hadn't seen snow geese. And uh, that trip then, which I took in late May and June, and the experiences I had up there was the basis for writing a book that I called Song of the North Wind, uh, a story of the snow goose. And it recounts a year in the life of a pair and ultimately a family of, of snow geese. And I was really, I, and I thought, I probably can't get this published anyway. It's, it's pretty far out. But I thought I'd submit it to, to three New York publishers and see if any of them might be interested. 
And uh, I submitted it to, I think, Houghton Mifflin and McGraw-Hill and Doubleday. And I thought, if I get turned out at all three, I'll just forget about it as a, as a waste of time. But almost immediately, Doubleday accepted it for publication. And uh, it did indeed come out as, uh, as Song of the North Wind. It originally, of course, came out in hardback and later was put into softback. It was in print with Nebraska Press for the better part of 20 years. And then it was translated into, of all things, Russian and Latvian. Uh, I have copies, I gave copies of the Russian and Latvian versions of this book to the Heritage Room way back when. Anyway, it was, it was kind of a transforming event for me because it was a, an attempt to tell a story in a popular way and uh, something quite different from anything that I had written for publication before. Um, I'll read just a part of, of the preface uh, to give you a sense of, of what I was trying to tell and how my own background played into it. This is the last couple of paragraphs of the preface. As a boy growing up in Wapaton, Wapaton's a small town in the Red River Valley near Fargo, I measured my winters not so much in conventional time intervals, but in the days until the geese returned to Lake Travers. Lake Travers is located just about on the boundary between North and South Dakota and Minnesota where those three states come together. By late March, I could find scattered groups of mallards and pintails in thawing creeks near town, but it wasn't until the first haunting cries of the wild geese penetrated the evening air that schoolwork became a drudgery. And the only important event of the day was the weekend weather forecast. When Saturday finally came, our family car would be loaded with a change of clothes, a thermos or two hip boots, binoculars, and when I finally had saved enough money to buy them, a camera and a telephoto lens. I'm talking about when I was a junior in high school. Within a half an hour, I would be simultaneously jockeying the car through the muddy and badly rutted country roads of northern South Dakota and searching the horizon for flying geese. By mid-morning, the birds were headed back into the marsh after their morning foraging session. It was only a short time before the direction of their movements made apparent the best location to hide in order to intercept their flight lines. This annual spring ritual of meeting the geese on their return from the south was more important to me than the opening of the hunting season. I hunted for a few years. The beginning of summer vacation or even the arrival of Christmas. The spring return of the geese represented my own epiphany, a manifestation of gods I could see, hear, and nearly touch as they streamed into the marsh. By evening, I would be wet and cold and exhausted from wading through icy waters and crawling through mud and snow. But during the drive home, my ears would resound to the cries of the wild geese. And when I closed my eyes that night, I saw them still, their strong wings flashing in the sunlight, their immaculate bodies projected against an azure sky. They were my criterion of beauty, my definition of wildness, my vision of paradise. I had little idea of where they had come from and even less the conception of where they were headed. I only knew I must be there to see them, to become a part of something I couldn't begin to understand, but which to me represented the primordial energy of life. Well, that book rather surprisingly sold very well, was re received very well, um, and it made me think perhaps I can write in a more popular vein and sort of supplement my, my <laughs> still rather meager university income with popular writing because my serious writing certainly wasn't doing that. Uh, so that was, that was the first effort in the mid-70s. Uh, then uh, I, somewhat later, got interested in the cranes, the sandhill cranes. Actually, I was interested in them from the uh, second year I was at Nebraska, the spring of 1962, I went out to uh, see the cranes on the plat and have done it every year since then. But I didn't think seriously about writing a book about the cranes until the 70s when I did a, a big, boring, serious book on the cranes of the world and felt once again like the, the goose thing, I should try to find a story that is 
readable and interesting to, if you will, the general public. I puzzled over that for a long time because I wanted it to cut a sort of a broad swath across American history and cover the whole continent and somehow deal with differing cultural attitudes about cranes. And I didn't know how I could do that in, in if you will, one, one story and, if you will, also one crane, one crane sort of encountering all of these parts of North America and differing cultures. And, and obviously it wasn't working. And I was sitting up at our Minnesota cottage one spring day, it would have been in uh, mid-May, staring out at the water of the lake and thinking about this, sort of puzzling over it. And suddenly it came to me, it doesn't really have to be one bird, it can be several birds, maybe four birds, and it doesn't have to be one year, it can be maybe four different periods in American history and four different parts of North America and four different cultures. Suddenly the sort of combination of four, four, four all came together. So I went running into the, into the cottage and sort of scribbled out in a, in a piece of paper with lines across and up and down the, the, the four seasons and the four times in North American history I wanted to talk about the four cultures, the four parts of geography that I wanted to discuss, and it all just sort of fit together. I had to uh, drive back to Lincoln. For one thing, I'd, I didn't have a typewriter at the cottage, but I had to get back to Lincoln to get ready for a uh, summer, a spring session out at our field station. So uh, I got back to Lincoln Monday morning. I uh, sat down and typed chapter one of, of this thing, and this, Tuesday I typed out chapter two, and Wednesday chapter three, and Thursday chapter four, and I was done, there were only four chapters. Friday I packed up my gear and went out to teach at our field station. And I did a fair number of drawings out there to make the book complete. And again, I submitted it in this case to a publisher I'd never dealt with, St. Martin's Press, but I, I knew they published some popular nature, so I thought I'd try them. And sure enough, they accepted it, and, and it got published then as a, as a little book like this, Those of the Grey Wind, a similar title to Song of the North Wind, and I originally thought maybe I'll write four books, four different winds. That never happened, but this was one of the reasons why I, I picked that title. But, um, but it likewise became a popular book and uh, remains in print to this day. Uh, it has sold, I don't know, 15 or 20,000 copies, I'm, I, I'm not sure, but, but uh, it has sold very well. And uh, uh, I don't think I'll read any of it. I don't want to waste too much time on, on, uh, on readings. But nonetheless, that was another kind of uh, landmark in my, my writing, if you will. About the same time, a little later, actually perhaps 10 years later, uh, I was approached by Smithsonian Press uh, to do a book on cranes, which uh, uh, I had I'd done this big boring book, as I said, on, San, on, on cranes of the world, and I'd done that little book on sandhill cranes, so I thought, well, maybe I can write a book on sandhill and hooping cranes and satisfy their desire for a book. By then, I think my writing was getting a little better. Uh, when are we? 19, it actually was published in uh, 1991, so quite a bit later than that book. Uh, and I was becoming maybe a, a little more uh, evocative, perhaps, in my writing. And uh, let me just pull out one or two readings that might be relevant to this season and, and uh, the Cranes in the Platte Valley. This is from a chapter called uh, Seasons of the Sandhill Crane, or Sandhill Spring. There is a river in the heart of North America that annually gathers together the watery largesse of melting Rocky Mountain snowfields, glaciers, and spills wildly down the eastern slopes of Colorado and Wyoming. Reaching the plains, it quickly loses its momentum and begins to spread out and flow slowly across Nebraska from west to east. As it does so, it cuts a sinuous tracery through the native prairies that have been followed for millennia by both men and animals. 
The river is the Platte. There's a season in the heart of North America that is an unpredictable day-to-day -day battle between bitter winds carrying dense curtains of snow out of Canada and the high plains, turning the prairies into ice sculptures, and contrasting summer breezes that equally rapidly thaw out the native tall grasses and caress them gently. The season is sweetened each dawn by the compelling music of western middle larks, northern cardinals, and greater prairie chickens. And the sky is punctuated throughout the day with skeins of migrating waterfowl. The season is spring. There's a bird in the heart of North America that is perhaps even older than the river and far more wary than the waterfowl or prairie chickens. It is as gray as the clouds of winter, as softly beautiful and graceful as the flower heads of Indian grass and big blue stem, and its penetrating bugle-like notes are as distinctive and memorable as the barking of a coyote or the song of a western middle lark. The bird is the sandhill crane. There's a magical time that occurs each year in the heart of North America when the river and the season and the bird all come into brief conjunction. Well, I think that's a little better writing than what I, I used to do and tries to become a little more uh, poetic, if you will. Uh, as I was mentioning in an earlier interview, Aldo Leopold really has been my, my model in writing since uh, I first read him back in high school as a senior. And uh, I've often thought that he was able to uh, uh, deal with sometimes fairly sophisticated ideas on ecology and, uh, and biology in, in relatively simple language. And so that's, that's been something that I've tried to do, even in my, my technical monographs. I've tried to couch them, uh, the wording in uh, as little jargon as possible and uh, make them readable to anybody who's uh, seriously wanting, wanting to get the information. Um, a few years ago, namely about two now, I had an, an art exhibit down at the Great Plains Art Center uh, called Migrations of the Imagination. And it was kind of a joint exhibit. I put together a bunch of my carvings, my sculptures, and, and uh, drawings. And Mike Forsberg, a local photographer, uh, put together a similar series of, of photographs dealing mostly with migrating birds, especially uh, cranes. And so we put on the show. It was in 2002, I think. Um, anyway, yes, March to June of 2002. Anyway, as, uh, in conjunction with that show, uh, we published a uh, collection of quotes uh, from a dozen or more of my books, I guess, uh, that I thought were relevant to the general subject of of uh, movement and migrations, and uh, to the Great Plains especially. I'll just read a couple of them at more or less random. This one is from a book called The Nature of Nebraska, which if I can sort of make a short aside, I wrote back in about 2001, and, and came out in 2001, I think, Partly because I uh, had gone out and spoken to a fourth grade class out in uh, Elwood, Nebraska, at the request of uh, the fourth grade teacher, and uh, saw how little information she had. She was teaching a fourth grade science course, how little information she had relevant to the state of Nebraska. And I thought, well, you know, if I write a book about Nebraska that a person such as she could use, or a college student, or high school student or whatever, uh, then it might be a useful contribution to the uh, literature of the state. And so that's how that book came about. Uh, it's a longer story than that, but, but that'll do. Uh, this is uh, then from The Nature of Nebraska. There are still places in Nebraska where one can lie back on a fragrant bed of last year's blue stem in early April with the half-intoxicating odor of freshly germinating grass invading one's nose and the shrill but majestic music of cranes almost constantly overhead, with occasional harmonies added by arctic bound, if nearly invisible geese. 
There is then a true sense of belonging to and being a part of the land, and one can only give an unspoken prayer that such treasures will still be there for those of the next generation to savor and love. At such times, one will realize that, although there may be places with higher mountains than Nebraska, with magnificent rock-bound coastlines or misty cloud forests, it really doesn't matter. This is our spiritual home, our self-chosen nirvana, our prairie-born paradise, the natural surviving legacy of long-forgotten winds, immense amounts of water, now vanished glacial ice, and unfathomable eons of time that has been freely bestowed upon us either to keep or to destroy. May we choose to keep it. And a little earlier, I did a book on the sand hills. I think I mentioned I, uh, I uh, spent some time teaching out at our field station near the sand hills. And it finally stimulated me to write a book on the sand hills called This Fragile Land. Imagine a place in the Great Plains where the nights are so dark that almost every star in the visible universe can be seen, and the evenings are so quiet that coyotes can be heard yipping for miles away. Visualize a land where the nearest grocery store or filling station may be 50 miles or more away, and where the sight of a billboard is sufficiently rare that one actually notices and reads it. Think of a locality where the presence of an old, discarded cowboy boot stuck upside down on a, on a foot fence post may be the only sign of human influence and where a line shown as a road on a state highway map may represent nothing more than two narrow tracks in bare sand that disappear over the hills without so much as the slightest hint that anything or anyone might exist at the other end. It is not a land for the faint-hearted, for those in a hurry to be somewhere else, or those unwilling to feel totally alone and self-reliant. It is a land, however, of gracefully bending horizons, of waving grass, shifting late afternoon shadows, of stunning sunsets, and of inner peace. It is called the Nebraska Sand Hills. And then I think from the same, same book, I finally began to realize the true heart and spirit of Nebraska is not to be found in our eastern cities, our vastly overrated football programs, or even in the historic and now dying Platte River that whispers sad dirges to times past as it glides eastward to meet an equally altered and degraded river. Rather, the state's pioneer spirit persists in the quiet recesses of our sand hills, particularly in the fortitude of the people who once homesteaded them and whose descendants still live there. And uh, from a slightly different but similar kind of topic, Skeins of snow geese still etch in March Nebraska sky from dawn to dusk. Prairie chickens still annually greet the spring sunrises with their ancestral rituals. And the spine-tingling calls of sandhill cranes coming into roost on the plat still bring with them the distant echoes of thundering bison, trumpeting mammoths, and even of times before recorded time. We can still totally lose ourselves in their grace and beauty, imagining that we have found some other Eden and hopefully resolve to act in such a way that these birds may still be able to cast their marvelous spells just as strongly on our descendants a century hence as they do today. I've fallen more, I've always loved the Great Plains having spent 90% of my life on them. And the longer I'm here, I think the more I'm entranced by them. And so of the last several books I've written, uh, of the last three or four books, I think They've all dealt in one way or another with the Great Plains. The Lewis and Clark on the Great Plains, um, Great Wildlife of the Great Plains, Prairie Birds, um, uh, Faces of the Great Plains. All of those are books that I've done in the last maybe five years or so, and they've all really concentrated on, on the plains. Um, I've lived in the mountains, and I've, I've uh, spent a lot of time on coastlines, but but uh, it's hard for me not to love the plains. Um, and 
How much time do I have, Joanna? When am I supposed to be done? Okay. All right. All right. I'll I'll uh, write. A, I'll read a couple more things about uh, that relate to the plains, at least. This is from Prairie Birds, which is a book about the 30 or so species of birds that are most abundant on the prairie and and largely adapted to the prairie. It's a curious fact of human nature that undulating lines are more interesting and jagged lines more visually exciting than straight lines. That simple truism is perhaps why there are far more books that have been published on the beauty of deserts and of mountain ranges than have ever been written on the plains and the plants and ecology of plains and prairies. Unless one has been born and raised on the prairies, a painting by Ro Mike Mark Rothko showing a broad horizontal red streak crossing an otherwise unicolored and dark background does not immediately strike the average viewer as representing a magnificent prairie sunset. That was from Prairie Birds. This is also from Prairie Birds. Each spring, the sun swings slowly northward until it reaches the vernal equinox in late March. Then, for a singular day, it pauses on the horizon at exactly due east and also sets precisely 12 hours later due west. At such times I am reminded of Eos, Greek goddess of the dawn, her pre-sunrise presence projected above the eastern horizon as pinky fingers of radiant light. We have a collective cultural memory of her to thank for the old English word east, meaning the direction of sunrise as well as the original pagan springtime celebration of Easter. It's an auspicious time to be alive, time above all to watch birds. The word auspicious is similarly of pre-Christian origin from the Latin in this case, meaning to divine the future by watching the movements of birds. And from great wildlife of the Great Plains. The Great Plains are thus a biological meeting place of northern, southern, eastern, and western elements, acquiring a kind of collective uniqueness simply by virtue of their central position, thereby becoming a sort of biological melting pot into which plants and animals have seeped from all around their edges. Like America itself, the Plains represent a kind of composite or self-assembled land whose strength lies in their diversity and whose remnants must be treasured and protected, if only in fragmentary remnants and locations. Um, so clearly, some of these things, at least, are a little more philosophical than the early writings I did. And I think probably most writers become a little more philosophical with age, maybe when they run out of real things to talk about. But, uh, but anyway, I think that, uh, that that's the fact. Here's something more about. Uh, cranes in the flat. We don't know what originally drew the cranes to the plat, but the unique present-day combination of a wide sandy river, nearby wet meadows with a supply of invertebrate foods for a source of calcium, and an almost unlimited amount of waste corn in nearby fields. For getting abundant, carbo for getting abundant carbohydrates that can be converted or stored as fat provide the magic attraction now. Millions of snow geese, Canada geese, and other geese join in this feast, as do several million ducks, making March in Nebraska a bird watcher's paradise. Its prospect alone is enough to warm the heart through the long days of winter, and the sounds of cranes filling the air when they finally do arrive is at least as thrilling as hearing a massed choir singing the triumphant chorus to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. How many of you have been out to see the cranes on the plat, out of curiosity? Well, the majority, at least slightly majority. It's, uh, it's something that I think everybody with any interest in the natural world should try to do. I, uh, I've seen the Serengeti, watched the wildebeests migrate on, on the African plains. I've flown over the Amazon. I've climbed a fair amount of the Andes. I've seen the interior of Australia. I've been to the Arctic many times. 
And at least in my opinion, there is no site, no natural site in the world that, that uh, matches uh, the Platte River in March. Joanna was saying she thought I probably had just come in today from the Platte. It's not quite true. I was there two or three days ago, and I leave again tomorrow. But I, I hate spending time in Lincoln during the middle to the latter part of March. And people would think, you must get tired of it, my god. But, but you don't. It, it's, it's simply different every day. The sunsets are different. The birds come in at different times, at different heights. Every day it's, a, it's sort of a renewable feast, visual feast, an auditory feast, an aesthetic feast. Uh, I, I can't imagine a time when I don't want to get out to see the cranes. They more or less supplanted geese, which were my first love for many, many years. Uh, and they have some of those same features. They're big and they're graceful and, and their plumage is beautiful and their behavior is complex. They have behavior in many ways rather humanoid. They stand, well, a sandhill crane this tall, a whooping crane this tall. They pair for life. They live enormously long time, up to 30, 40 years commonly in the wild. They have strong family bonds. They migrate as a family. They, they stick together. The male protects the female and the young. They have all these wonderful features that we think humans should have, which we may or may not have, and are incredibly graceful. There's simply uh, no other bird, I think, to my mind, that is quite so graceful as a crane. They're very old. They've been around 50, 60 million years, and they've gone through a lot in terms of loss of habitat and, and persecution by, by many uh, cultures. Many cultures adore them, res revere them, but uh, in America we seem to shoot everything that's bigger than a bread box, and, and uh, we kill 20 to 30,000 cranes for sport every year. It's hard to believe. And so they have to put up with us as best they can. And, and so you, you don't get close to cranes. They're extremely wary, far more wary than any species of goose or any other wild bird I've ever encountered. So you have to approach them with a great deal of respect. And, and my heart just simply beats faster whenever I see or, or hear cranes. It, there's, there's simply no way to explain, to, for me at least, the wonders of those birds. And so, uh, so I, I look forward to March in the same way that as a child I looked forward to April and the arrival of the snow geese in North Dakota. Now it's, it's March. They typically arrive about Valentine's Day, nearly the middle of February, and they stay until about the 5th to the 10th of April, depending on the weather. So they're highly predictable. And I usually know within a day or two of when they're likely to arrive on the plat, just watching the weather, watching the, the wind direction and amount, and having some sense of uh, the amount of snow cover out on the plat. So they're as predictable as, uh, as almost anything in nature in the sense of arriving and departing. Uh, but when you deal with, with cranes, sort of person to person, if you will, then they're, they're less predictable. You don't know how long they're going to hang around. You don't know uh, just how they'll respond to you. And part of it probably depends on when they were last shot at or, or how familiar they are. Mm -hmm. they, they, they come to, I think, understand what the person is doing. I mean, clearly, if you're carrying something that looks like a rifle or a gun, you're not going to get very close. Uh, but if you don't pay any attention and just sort of walk off at 45 degree angles to the flock, then, then they'll probably tolerate you reasonably well. But unlike a lot of birds, they're always, in my mind, always thinking about what you're about. And so they, it becomes a challenge to get close enough to really see what they're doing. And. Uh, their behavior is sufficiently complex. They, they have expressions in the same way that you and I have expressions. We can raise an eyebrow or something like that and convey 
communication, crane communication, is often just about that subtle, uh, preening the wing feathers or, or uh, uh, shaking, the, shaking the wings or tail or simply exposing more red skin on the top of the head. All those things have, have meaning to other cranes at least. And uh, so it becomes possible to sort of read, read what they're about and you can work out family bonds and you can work out amounts of, of uh, courtship going on and uh, it, it becomes a kind of a window into a, a very different world, but a very interesting one. Um, let me, s I think I've still got maybe five, uh, here's a couple more things about cranes. Well, this is a more general one. This is from Great Wildlife. Years seem far, far too short for naturalists, with single seasons even briefer. Springs come and go so rapidly that the summer blooming prairie roses seem to appear even before the blossoms of pasque flower and purple avens have been transformed into wispy filaments of prairie smoke. Yet for a few weeks each spring and fall, the Great Plains are visited from the air by uncountable millions of transients. Many move silently at night, with the only clear evidence of their passage being the broken bodies of small nocturnal migrant birds lying at the base of tall buildings. Perhaps while watching the pinpricks of light from distant stars, they fail to see those colossal objects in front of them. Others we hear but don't see, as in the choruses of migrating waterfowl flying high above the reflected lights of our cities intent on reaching some unknown destination beyond our ken. Many are so large or move in such numbers that we cannot overlook them. We come to measure our springs and falls by their regular appearance. These comings and goings are often the natural guideposts of our lives, as in the spring we saw the hooping cranes or the winter of the snowy owls. Such events seem to provide far more satisfying memory posts than, for example, the year I turned 40 or 70. Uh, and still on cranes. Migrating cranes still gather during spring in almost uncountable numbers to rest and sleep beside the peaceful sandbars of the Platte. Through the night, the birds converse with the river, speaking in tongues that are both archaic and seemingly wise, and the river patiently listens. The voice of the river is even softer, and possibly even older than that of the birds. We would do well to try to hear and understand its plaintive message while it is still able to speak. And last summer, it was no longer able to speak. It dried completely for the first time in decades. And that'll probably happen again this summer. Well, as you see, I'm hung up on birds and especially on cranes and hung up on the Nebraska. And uh, probably continue to write about those subjects uh, for as long as I write. Uh, I'm working on a book on the Niobrara right now, working on a book on the uh, uh, High Plains, the Prairie Dog Empire, as I'm calling it. Both of them, I hope, will be published by Nebraska Press. I know that the Prairie Dog one will, and I'm hoping that the uh, Nibrera book will be similarly received. And beyond that, I, I, I don't know. I have a big art show coming up in May on the plants and animals of Lewis and Clark. I drew 20 or 30 uh, plants and animals for that show and photographed another 50 or 60 species. And uh, two, two friends of mine have either photographed, well photographed, uh, many of the additional plants and animals, John Farrar, the plants, and a Kansas friend, Bob Grass, most of the other animals. So we'll be able to show by drawings or photographs all 150 roughly species of the plants and animals that Lewis and Clark encountered on the Great Plains. That show starts in May at the Great Plains Art Center and will run through the summer. So, uh, so if you're interested in Lewis and Clark, uh, 
Well, I hope you'll find time to see it. Uh, we might have time for a question or two, do we, Joanna? Okay, yeah. Uh, you're nodding your head as if you wanted to have a question, or maybe you were just. I was saying, yes, you have time for questions. Oh, okay. Is there anybody who I haven't put to sleep? Yeah. yeah. Wait. But we know that, you know, uh, the Ukraine's are in Nebraska for three weeks or what happened. Yeah, about a month. How long does an individual train stay in the. Stay yeah, there aren't many that have been banded with telemetry equipment to the point that we know the exact days. But the belief is that it probably takes about three weeks for them to gain a pound of fat. They weigh about five pounds coming in. They gain about a pound going out. And they have to spend just about every hour of every day during that three or maybe four week period looking for corn, mainly corn. Collectively, the birds are here, as I said, from usually mid-February till early April. So that's about a six week six or seven week period, but most cranes are probably here only about half of that amount of time. They straggle in over a period of several weeks, reach a peak about the end of March, and then depending on the weather, the south winds and so on, dropping off very rapidly the first week to 10 days of, of April. So, so that's the general story, but very, cranes are so wary, it's very hard to, to capture them alive and put telemetry on them. There are about five or six that have uh, such equipment uh, from last year, and they were tracked all the way, in some cases, to Siberia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they crossed the Bering Strait. I've stood on the Pribilof, one of the Pribilof Islands in about the first week of June and seeing cranes headed for Siberia, probably 100 miles away, they crossed the Bering Strait. Uh, and that's surely one of the most dangerous parts of their migration. Not all go to Siberia, but about 100,000 probably do out of a half a million. Uh, yeah? Do you have a favorite Anto Crane anecdote? Huh. Well, I guess, uh, <laughs> I suppose. Tom Mangelson was a student of mine, and he's now world famous wildlife photographer. Um, and he and I, when he was a student in 69, 70, used to go out uh, to uh, the Platte River, the Central Platte near Grand Island, and try to photograph waterfowl, ducks, and geese, and also cranes. I had photographed ducks and geese most of my life for 20 years prior to that. Tom was just learning. But he wanted to photograph cranes especially, and so he went to Cabela's, which is a sporting good place, bought the most expensive crane decoys, beautiful plastic uh, full-body decoys with, you know, hand-painted eyes, and from 10 feet away, they looked exactly like a crane. And so I think he bought three or four of them. They were pretty expensive. And then we set out a hundred or so of duck decoys to try to lure in the sandhill cranes. It's very easy to lure in ducks and geese. They're relatively stupid. You could put out white Clorox bottles and bring in snow geese. But the cranes, we soon learned, if you wanted the cranes not to land on a particular island, you put a decoy there because <laughs> they, they knew immediately that was a fake crane. So, so in a sense, you just use the decoys to get the birds to land somewhere else. Uh, so in a sense, I guess that's an anecdote about the, uh, the visual uh, capabilities of cranes. Uh, the, I've always thought they were at least as smart as I am, and probably smarter. Um, I can't think of any others that at, the, at the moment, but funny things happen, of course, every, every time you're, you spend a lot of time with wild animals. I uh, went to the Arctic in 63 or so to photograph and study eiders, which are Arctic nesting ducks. and. Uh, uh, I wasn't very interested in cranes then, even though they were nesting in that same tundra. And I didn't even try to photograph them. And of course, later I cursed myself for not having good photographs of sandhill cranes on their tundra nesting grounds. And the only ones I got were way out of focus where I was focusing on emperor geese or something like that in the foreground. And there'd be two brownish gray blobs in the distance. And they never came closer than probably a quarter mile. But using that experience, I, uh, I was able to write the first chapter in uh, Those of the Gray Wind Experiences on the Tundra and on Sandhill Crane Nesting Grounds. 
Um, uh, any other questions? I think we've probably used up the time. I appreciate you all coming on such a nice evening. I'd like to think that this has been very illuminating. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I'll hang around a little while, I guess. Uh, I'm leaving tomorrow for the crane, so uh, got to get home and pack. Anyway, thanks again. And thank you for yeah. filming it.